right. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome uh, to our first pop-up session for UDL AT Network. Um, people will be rolling in as, they, uh, as the clock strikes one or whatever number it's striking where you live. Here in Ontario, it's one o'clock. And uh, we just want to say a really warm welcome to everyone and do a few introductions. So for, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those who we don't know each other yet, my name is Jody Black. I'm a, a teaching and learning specialist at Fleming College in Peterborough, Ontario, and uh, one of the co-chairs of the UDLAG network. And we're, Jen and Eric and I are so pumped to be able to share uh, this pop-up session with you and, um, and to be learning together and th that everyone can join in in the summer heat and uh, for some off-cycle <laughs> UDL moments. Um, we'll introduce uh, Liz, who's our guest facilitator today, um, just after a few, a few welcomes. So I'll do a little overview of what you can expect for our pop-up session today, and then pass it over to Jen and Eric to say hello as well. So for our pop-up, we'll uh, we're scheduled till about three o'clock. And, um, and this pop-up session is something new that we're trying. So we're just trying to do something that can be a little bit more ad hoc, a little bit more uh, grassroots. We love grassroots to start with, but even more grassroots is, is a great experiment too. And hoping that this is something that other people might want to host as well on topics that they're interested in or things that are happening um, at your post-secondary or that you would like to share. So the pop-ups, just for some context for our network, we're thinking that, they're, um, that they can be these ad hoc um, meetings uh, or gatherings more than a meeting, I think, uh, that any of you too could think of a topic uh, to host as well. So just to put that bug in people's ears that if there's something that is that you would like to host for a pop-up, that option, uh, we can certainly support you explore that option. Um, so that's just a little overview of the pop-up and Liz will give us more details about the agenda for today, but I think we can expect a lot of, a lot of thinking, a lot of discussion, and probably feeling like we want more time than we have when three o'clock comes or whatever time that is where you are. So um, with that, that's enough of me talking. I'm going to pass it over to, I'll pass it over to Jen next to say hello and uh, just a really warm welcome to everyone. Glad to see you. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm glad everybody was able to join in today. Um, my name is Jennifer Pusateri. I'm the Universal Design Consultant for uh, the University of Kentucky Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching. Um, we are really excited about today's pop-up. You know, we, we like to schedule things in advance for UDL AG, but we recognize that, you know, there are going to be things that pop up um, throughout the time, uh, throughout the year when we didn't have anything scheduled and we wanted to be able to address those um, as a group and as the UDL HE network. So we're really glad that you could join us today. And I'll pass it to Eric. Uh, so I'm Eric Moore. I'm at the University of Tennessee Knoxville as a UDL and accessibility specialist and I'm uh, also honored to be one of the co-facilitators of this network. Uh, today, the, one of the big things that we wanted to accomplish with the pop-up session was to really develop our capacity to get back to roundtable discussion. As you can see, this group has grown a lot over the last few years. We started with seven people. Now we have about 400 people um, that are members in this community, which is wonderful. Um, you know, but we, we did feel we are sometimes losing touch with the small group discussion that was so I mean, we prized in the early days. And so with these pop-ups, one of the things we're trying to do um, is get back to that. So even with a group this size, today we're going to be moving into breakout rooms on a couple of occasions so that we can get that feel back. Those breakout rooms are going to be random assignment of about six to eight people. Um, and so when, when you see the pop-up at that time, it'll just be join this room and you'll go into that room. We'll ask that one person in that room volunteer to be somebody who just helps facilitate the dialogue, make sure that everybody has a chance to talk, you know, that sort of thing. And at least one other person to record um, the conversation or, or to take highlight notes type things in our shared Google document, which will be in the chat if it's not already. Um, so please just assign those roles when you get there and we'll, we'll take about 15, 20 minutes for those conversations and then we'll come back together and Liz will help us debrief a little bit and then guide us into the next conversation. Um, so that's forthcoming today and I hope that that is successful. Thanks for joining everyone.
Liz, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Yeah. There we go. I can start. I was uh, jokingly at previous meetings um, planning for this saying this is that the most common statement is I need to unmute or you need to unmute um, in these strange times. Um, so, Bojo, Neiman Mijikan Kwe Dijnakas, Mijikan Dodem, Anishinaabe Kwe Minwa Lene Lanape and Dao, Amjanong Minwa Bidasagi Dunjaba, Nogo Joanang Megwa Doda and Fleming College, uh, Dunjanaki. So my name is Liz Stone, and uh, I am Ojibwe in Delaware, or Anishinaabe in Lene Lenape. Uh, my home communities are, uh, I have dual citizenship and the contemporary view, and so I have two communities. I have tribal affiliation in Badoski, Michigan. Badoski, or Petoski, or Badasagi. So the confusion there is our community and our, our um, family name actually was Badasagi, and the area was settled by uh, Pol Polish people. And so they kind of Polishized their name to Petoskey. And if any of you guys have been to Petoskey, Michigan, that's originally Badasagi. Um, and my Canadian affiliation is Amdranong First Nation, which is Sarnia First Nation, Chemical Valley, the Southwestern Ontario. Um, I am a mom, I'm a sister, I'm an auntie, I'm a friend, um, all of those things. And I happen to work at Fleming College. So currently I'm the academic chair of Indigenous Perspectives. Um, I have been at Fleming College in so many different capacities for about 12, 13 years. Uh, the first time that they actually put me on the payroll <laughs> was about five years ago, and it was through the learning design and support team. And so that was when I first um, was introduced to actually uh, UDL and, and all the great things that happen in your uh, worlds and offices and extra time, spare time, and where, where a lot of people's passions, including my own life. So I think that we're going to get started. Is that good? Is there anything that I missed? Jody, Eric, Jennifer? I think we're all good. Yeah. Just all right. So I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, and, and also I would really encourage you once you get into uh, your small groups, I would love to and normally do ask everybody to go around and introduce themselves and try doing that from an indigenous perspective where where we work is actually the last thing we mentioned. Um, so there's so many other things about us. So encourage you when you get into your small groups to um, try to introduce yourself if you feel comfortable uh, to do that from an Indigenous perspective. So I'm going to start here. So first of all, I want to acknowledge um, and say chimigwech or thank you um, to to the planning group for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I really enjoy um, talking to people and, and being in a, in a room, in a bubble, in a virtual space with like-minded people. And you're all here because we do have those um, like-minded thoughts. I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, so what we're going to talk about today are, is uh, supporting culture through UDL and, and vice versa. Um, one of the things that, that happens when um, I'm in these um, places and where we're discussing these things is there's, there's a couple things that happen. Um, everybody's really excited about universal design for learning. Everybody's really excited about culture because those are two things that, that uh, we come together for and we celebrate. Um, we all have culture in our, our lives and we're all part of different cultures and we all really, uh, whether we know it or not, have universal design for learning in our lives. It's, it's how we learn, it's how we teach, it's how uh, we go through life and experience things. Um, so making sure that our conversations today are going to be touching on those things. Uh, and that's the place in which I'm coming from. Um, so Again, we discussed a, a little bit about what was going to happen today, but I have it on a, a screen here, a little bit of our agenda. Uh, so we're at the point where we're going to talk about culture and we're going to experience our first um, kind of breakout session, our conversations 
um, indigenous pedagogy is also a way that um, also includes not just teaching and telling people uh, what they they may perceive that they don't know, but actually giving back and forth and and having people be empowered to um, empowered to share their understanding of culture. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, go into small groups. Eric, if you can help me out and answer these questions. Uh, so when we're thinking about culture specifically, we all have our own ideas and our preconceived ideas or experiences or understanding about what culture is. So what is your understanding, your personal understanding? Not by rote, not what we've learned, uh, not what somebody else has, has told us culture is, but what is your understanding of culture? Another question that would be, um, Good for you to discuss and share back with us. Is your understanding or experience with culture strongly connected to race? Um, usually, it's been my experience, based on my visible appearance, that uh, when I talk about culture, people automatically assume that I'm talking about Indigenous culture. It has something to do with race. Also, when I introduce myself, I do it in Anishinaabe Moan. And so people automatically say, okay, she's indigenous. Okay, so it all automatically goes to race. It's not a terrible thing, it's not a bad thing, it's not a wrong thing. It's just something that I acknowledge and something that we need to acknowledge as people. Um, and, and for sure I acknowledge and for sure sometimes that's a privilege that I utilize because it, it can be pretty impressive when somebody is speaking a different language. I feel pretty proud when I'm speaking in Anishinaabe Moan. And so really, how do we identify how strongly our understanding of culture is connected to race? Um, what are cultural considerations for you personally? So as I mentioned at the beginning, we all have connection to culture. So what are your personal connections to culture? What culture, cultural considerations or cultures do you have in the institutions or workplaces that you're in? And then also the greater community. So I'm asking you to talk about these three questions specifically and those three areas specifically in the last question, uh, because from an Indigenous pedagogy or Indigenous worldview or way of being, um, how I relate that is we think about ourselves first. If you think about a wheel or a, a circle with three, three um, descending sizes, the, the very center is ourselves. And we look at ourselves and we say, what is my understanding of, of culture? And because that's going to have a bias or a lens or um, impact on all of those other understandings of culture. So then I look to a smaller community or family, and that's where I inputted the institution and said, okay, so what cultures are, are happening in our institution? And what is my understanding of culture? Um, how does that impact? that smaller or um, community, smaller uh, institution, the broader picture of things. And then finally, the greater community. So if you have an institutional culture and a personal culture, uh, your institution sits somewhere and what's the impact on the community culture? So for myself, uh, I work at Fleming College, uh, Sutherland campus. So what is my work at Fleming College? Um, and how does it impact the Peterborough community? Is there collaborations? Is there partnerships? And what kind of culture in that community do I have to consider and how does it impact us in the institution? And then again, me personally. So it's always growing, it's always living, it's always moving. So if you can begin to talk about those three questions and jot down some ideas, it doesn't have to be um, in any specific order um, and jot down some um, key points that you would bring back to the group. And we will have about 20 minutes, give or take, to do that. And I'm going to attempt to, fingers crossed, rotate between your rooms. Um, questions, comments, concerns before we, we go into that? No? All right.
Okay, uh, so again, once you're in those groups, if somebody will just kind of uh, assume the role of, of managing the discussion and at least one person to keep that not notes in that shared Google document, that would be wonderful. Uh, if you have problems when you're in the breakout room, there's a little question mark and a circle that says ask for help. And if you click on that, it alerts the host um, that we need to come in there and give you a hand. So feel free to use that if necessary. And we'll see you back soon. Eric, how many groups did you make? I made eight groups of six. Stacy, are you able to get into a room? Um, hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Chase. Um, I'm an instruction designer for American University um, for the Kogar School of Business. Hi everyone, my name is Ruth. Um, I'm an Associate Director with Student Affairs at Douglas College in BC and this is my cat who won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go next. I'm Luis Perez. I'm a technical assistant specialist for the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. And the AIM Center is a federally funded technical assistance center that is based at CAST. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Arfin and um, I'm, I'm an instructional designer right now and a teaching and learning specialist at Humber College. I'm also um, part or partial load faculty there as well in, in Canada, Toronto, Canada. Um, yeah. I'll go next. <laughs> Again, sorry for any noise. I am walking. Um, my name is Denia Bradshaw. I, uh, I am finishing up or I'm pretty much done. Uh, getting, I'm getting an EDD, um, an educational leadership doctorate at California State University, Los Angeles. Uh, I, I finished all my revisions. I'm going to read the whole thing today, send it to an editor. But my, uh, my research was on uh, UDL and um, students with hidden disabilities practices, perceptions, beliefs, and um, just trying to learn more. And um, yeah, my last time being a student, happy to be here to talk about these things with you all. And again, sorry for the sound, so I'm gonna mute myself. Is there anyone else in our group? I'm trying to see. I've already introduced myself, so <laughs> but, yeah, oh. I'm good. <laughs> okay, cool. So, uh, does anyone want to write in the document? Does anyone feel excited about taking notes? I am taking notes. You're taking notes? Yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Sure. So do we have, I'm sorry, so the questions, are we able to see the questions anywhere or do we just Yeah, so the them? first question is, is what is your understanding of culture? And I'll take notes, so feel free to um, talk about culture right now. I'm gonna drop them into the chat as well, which I think are only visible to everyone in the breakout room, just in case you have them there as well. That's correct.
So maybe I'll start. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's so funny. I have to say, with all the Zoom and all the stuff that we're doing all the time, it's it is so different from being in a room with people, and then you see like who's feeling like they want to go first or like what's happening. So it really, I, I feel like it's such a funny, it's like everyone's waiting, you know, and, and being so lovely and waiting for someone to go. Um, so I really liked what Liz said about, you know, what does culture mean to you versus what we've learned, <laughs> uh, you know, in our, in our schooling, in our educational system. But I'm finding it really hard to not think of, you know, and I don't know how everyone else is feeling, but like what I learned culture was. Um, and I feel like culture is just such a big complex thing. Um, but what comes to mind, I'm trying to not think of all these, you know, definitions, but when I think about culture um, personally, and maybe I'll start there because she, she was talking about, um, I like the, the three different circles right like the self the smaller community and then the greater community i guess um but when i think about culture just personally if i think about for example like what is my culture i do think about um i think about uh maybe just different part aspects of myself and my identity perhaps um and connections to different smaller groups and then larger groups. Um, so for example, I'm Jewish, so I feel like that's my culture, um, for example. Um, and then, you know, I'm, and I'm from Toronto, so it's like I'm a Torontonian and perhaps that's a different culture from those that are not from Toronto. Um, so it's kind of like maybe relational to who, to who I'm speaking with. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of just, you know, trying to get rid of these other definitions. So I'm just throwing that out there. Well, um, a follow up on that. I think um, traditional ways of thinking of culture are very fixed. And to me, I see culture as like all those culturally, uh, those socially mediated perspectives that you develop uh, over time. So they're not fixed because they're mediated by the environment that you're in, the people you interact with. Um, and so, uh, they are, like you said, part of your identity, but it's not something that there are some aspects that are more stable, but there are some aspects of culture that change over time. This idea of, of identity is interesting to me. I'm wondering because identity exists apart from culture to some extent, you know, I'm wondering if, if identity is, is sort of, you know, my, my personal sort of comes from within in a sense, but then I identify with a culture. So the culture itself has an identity that I sort of assume. And kind of like what you were saying, Jamie, maybe maybe I can assume cultural identities at times that best suit me, you know? So, so when I'm in one environment, a church environment or a synagogue or whatever, I take on the fullness of an identity of my religious group. Whereas when, I, when I'm in a, a, an environment with other access, accessibility specialists, I'm thinking more as a professional identity, you know, but so that identity is sort of mediated in this relationship with a larger group, rather than being an in, in innate sense of who I am, in, you know, fully in, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but there's some sort of a, a, a relationship between the individual and a larger context. Um, it's interesting. Uh, everything everyone said so far, sorry, I'm wearing my mask, so I'm gonna take it off because I don't see anybody. But um, I, <laughs> I, I grew up, so my mom is from Sonora, Mexico, and my dad's from here. And I grew up with this like biracial identity. And when I was younger, having gone to kindergarten in Mexico, and not learning English until I was like six, um, I, I, I felt like my identity was very Hispanic. However, my background is, I have a bachelor's and a master's in classical music, and there's, <laughs> there's so much whiteness embedded in that curriculum, and I feel like, and then I love it, a lot of, the, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> a lot of the reasons I did classical music, because my grandma, my father's mother, was a classical pianist, and um, I, I noticed, I kind of, I almost, as I reflect in the last couple years as I've been working on this doctorate, I feel like I abandoned my 
my Hispanic heritage. So I've been trying to kind of like, I don't know if it makes sense to what I'm saying, but I don't know if this is what happens when you, you identify with two, uh, I hate the word race, two cultures. <laughs> and this is where culture, it's like, it feels fixed, but it's also so broad. Um, and why do I mention all this? It's just, I don't know, it just got me thinking about, it, it's just so unique to everyone, what it, how they define it. And, um, and I think part of the problem is because of maybe some fixed beliefs, uh, people get, uh, they start putting people in boxes. Um, but like, I don't fit in a box. I'm part of two places and more and more. I have a brother with a disability, which is a lot of the reason, not that UDL is about disability, but it's about, you know, <laughs> honoring all, all people, all learners. So I don't know, sorry, I didn't mean to go on a tangent. I just had to add that. <laughs> Well, that kind of segues into the second question, though. The, the second question follows up on that by, is, is your understanding or experience with culture strongly connected to race? And, and this, this question kind of came up. We, we decided to have this pop up in response to things that were happening in North America and especially the United States in the last several months, um, you know, and, and wanted to, to have a conversation, a critical conversation about what, what would a UDL response to this be? Um, you know, and Liz, who is facilitating this, really sees race is part of a larger picture with culture and so this this is her framing of it but we did want to touch on on this as well um is there is there a relationship between race and culture in your understanding and your personal experience so i i see it as more of a um so a larger kind of stepping back out uh, thinking about colonialism right so i'm actually from the caribbean where race is a very complicated thing because history, you know, over time, many different groups have come to the nation that I'm from and have sort of instituted rule and their own laws and their own customs and so on. And so like uh, Dania, I'm sort of a mix. I'm biracial, bicultural, grew up in two countries. And so one of the things that we have to learn when you grow up in that kind of environment is code switching. So you, like you said, Eric, you kind of figure out what environment you're in and then you sort of adopt different uh, ways of speaking, different things like that. So I can't see how like if you are in the United States or if you're in any other nation that has a history of colonialism, how you can avoid the issues of race and culture uh, in any way. I guess I've been thinking of this recently more in terms of privilege as opposed to race, but the two are very closely intertwined. So I think I, it fits with this question. I've been thinking about things that kind of are, have been assumed um, that COVID is kind of um, changing or at least illustrating what some assumptions were. And recently I've been thinking a lot about um, how the situation with COVID has made things so uncertain. So even in terms of something as privileged as planning a vacation, right? Or planning a trip to see friends or family. Um, that's something that, you know, four months ago would have been a given. Something that of course you can plan a six months out or plan a year out. And, and now that level of certainty and planning has been changed or threatened or eradicated uh, for the time being. So I'm really like, as I, we're talking about culture, I'm kind of thinking about the parts of your culture or your privilege that you don't even recognize until it's challenged in some way or, or lost in some way. Actually, I want to add to that. Oh, take off the mask again. Um, I, I gotta admit, I felt very uh, discriminated as a little kid because I didn't speak the language. <laughs> language, I can't even say that right right now. But I, I had a lot of issues. Even one teacher, dare I say, kind of almost like was a bully to me. And my mom pulled me out of that class, let her have it, put me in another school. And I, I gotta admit, speaking of privilege, because my last name is Bradshaw and I'm, I'm pretty light skinned, I, I passed. I, and, and I, and I, when I was little, I thank God that I passed just because of those experiences. 
but again, like I mentioned earlier, I feel like I, I was, I kind of like abandoned certain things by, by being like that, but it, but it was safe for me because I had been treated so poorly when I was younger. <laughs> and I'm sure that confused teachers, they see this like light skinned kid, last name Bradshaw doesn't speak English. Um, but I just wanted to add to that from my experience as a child and how that affected me and the way I lived my life later. And then I had to kind of like critically think like, hey, like, no, this is part of you too and you're proud of it. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I love what you're saying. And, and Ruth, I'm wondering if, you know, the part of the privilege, you know, we, we often attribute it to, to those in power, you know, racially, socially, whatever. Um, I wonder if schools, you know, obviously schools have cultures too, you know, and, and when we were talking about we sort of assume the identity of, of the culture, but, but that assumes agency. And, and sometimes we don't have that agency. You know, students who step into a school culture don't get to decide, oh yes, I'm part of this school culture, <laughs> right? It's just, you know, it, it, I guess in some situations, it's like stepping into a foreign language, you know, fair, a culture that you're not familiar with and that you don't, you don't understand the rules and, and, the, and the customs and so forth. And, and, it, and yet for a lot of us, like, like me, who, you know, I've come from a family where everybody had advanced degrees and so on and so forth. Like it just, it feels so at home to me and it always has, <laughs> you know, where I know, I know the rules almost innately, but maybe what, what we're, what we're having to come to realize is that that culture is dominated by, by other culture influences and groups that have held power for a long time and might itself be disenfranchising to some people like what Dania is saying. And I apologize, Dania, if I pronounce your name correctly or incorrectly, but that is something that <laughs> late, lately I've become really conscious of because you talked about passing. And so my name is Luis Perez. I, I think it's been 30 years since I've last heard somebody who's not a member of my family pronounce it correctly. Uh, so I've been Luis Perez and I hadn't corrected people for a long time, but lately I've started correcting people people because I feel like you said uh, I feel a little bit more empowered um, by the discussions that are taking place to really kind of step in and say no that's not the way that my name is pronounced and that's a big part of my identity uh, and an identity that like you uh, in order to sort of pass and be successful I've put aside in the past and to the point where I almost lost the ability to speak Spanish which is my first language because as an immigrant, there was this pressure to so assimilate and be part of the great American story, whatever that is. Uh, I mean, I think we're part of the American story <laughs> as much as anybody else. Uh, so I become more conscious of things that um, are, you know, microaggressions, uh, like not pronouncing somebody's name correctly. So uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but it's important to just always be aware of those things and. Um, you know, I have privilege as a, a Hispanic male and coming from a culture where it's very much patriarchal. And so uh, it's important to recognize that in some cases you have privileges that you haven't realized before. Um, so again, it's just thinking about like all the complexities that come into building a person's identity. It's not as simple as, you know, putting you into a box, uh, which by the way, and I have a biracial kid. So what box do they check? being Dominican Filipino. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's so interesting you mentioned the name thing. So I got to add more. <laughs> so my name is a Spanish name. It's Denia, as if there were an accent on the E. So I was pronouncing However, it correctly. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's how I introduced myself. Yeah, but um, the, I tell, and this, I've, and, and like you said, you started correcting people. I started doing that. I mean, you can only correct someone so many times, but you know, that's, that's fine. That's okay. But you know what I've done because of my name and so many people having issues with my name is I've had to change my name. I started telling people, my name is Dinia, like the Gardenia, but it's not. But so many people call me Dinia because I, I wanted to make it easier for them. But I also got tired of being called all these like five, 10 different versions of my name. But yeah, anyway, I wanted to add to that how I gave up the truth to my name to make it easier for someone else. And I hate that I've done that for so many years. So anyway. 
Actually, you know, I used to be an English teacher in, in Indonesia and South Korea, and I taught a literature and culture class, language and culture, and, and some of my students were doing these linguistic autobiographies because they were all least bilingual, um, you know, and they, they were learning in a language that was not their mother tongue, almost without exception. And some of them talked about, you know, in Korea, they oftentimes send their children to English-speaking countries because that's the only way that they can get into international schools and you know, these prestigious type schools in, in Korea. And I, I remember some of the stories where these students, when they went to schools in Canada or the United States, and they were assigned a name, you know, like, we can't figure out how to pronounce you Lim, so we're going to call you Sherry, <laughs> you know, or something. And then that was just the name that they assumed. And by the time I got them in high school, they had changed their identity. They were Sherry, not you Lim anymore, you know, and, and how, and getting them to reflect on that and, and the, the trauma of that that, had, that they hadn't really processed was an important and, and interesting sort of thing. And maybe it's not always that explicit, but, but yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying. And so for the last question, there are, I mean, do you guys have any other comments that you wanna add? And feel free to add your comments in the group three section too, um, to kind of, expand upon what I've said or what I've put down as well because I want to make sure I accurately give everybody's um, statement. So with question three, what are cultural considerations for you personally, your institution, greater community? Um, I'll just say a few things um, that everything that um, people here have been discussing have kind of brought to mind and one of one of the things that it's making me reflect upon is just I think right now during COVID and I think I think Ruth was saying you know it's really heightened or exacerbated existing in inequalities and inequities right um, but it's allowed for some real discussion and hopefully there's going to be change or movement <laughs> um, with, with a lot of what's going on. I mean, I was reflecting, I've been reflecting a lot of on, on my privilege um, and also on my, on my schooling as well. I'm so sorry. I have to turn off my email. Um, but here in, well, in Ontario, in Toronto, when I was in uh, the public school system, for example, we were taught that, like when we talked about stop racism, um, we had like a stop racism campaign, I remember, but the whole thing was colorblindness, which is, you know, we're all the same, we don't see color, like that's what we were taught and and identifying race was like racist like if you like you were racist if you said you know well this person is black maybe they're having a different experience for example right it's like oh don't don't say that right like don't don't point that out so that was the schooling that myself and many of my peers came came up in um and many of my peers you know are black or are of, of different, have different colors of skin, you know, um, and how might that have made them feel is, you know, beyond me. I mean, now we're, we're categorizing that as a, as a microaggression when people say, oh, I don't see color, I'm okay. I don't have to think about these things, right? Um, fast forward to now, um, we're ha we're, these discussions are, are being had when I first learned about critical race theory, this is the last thing I'll say. When I learned, uh, first learned about critical race theory, uh, it was in my graduate work. And I was like, yes. It was like, all of a sudden I was like, yeah, of course, of course. I know that I'm looked at differently. I know when I walk into a store, certain people are being watched and I'm not being watched. I'm being treated in a certain way. Like I see that. And it's not just in the US, it's here in Canada as well. Um, and I know I have a different relationship with the police. I know that, you know, uh, growing up, it was very, very, very apparent. Um, and so anyway, I think all of this being said, I think 
for that very last question, you know, I think this inward reflection that's happening for a lot of us is, is so important and is maybe a positive result <laughs> at the end of this and thinking about culture and race. Um, but also, you know, institutionally, like in our smaller communities and in our larger communities, I think it's really, really, really important. So I'll leave it at that. I'm going to go back to the main room and start start pulling people back in with that. So we'll see you in a minute. Well, that was um, a little bit of a bummer. It was a little too short, and that's my fault. My apologies. I, I missed, uh, I believe, room seven and eight. I was trying to pop into all of them, uh, so my apologies there. But what... Um, what an amazing uh, uh, group of conversations and uh, that I was kind of, I felt a little like I was peeping, uh, like I was spying on you guys, but I, I really just amazing conversations and, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, I can imagine that seven and eight uh, also had awesome conversations because everybody, everybody was right on track and I was like, yes, usually sometimes, well, usually, I have to prod people to have those um, uncomfortable or difficult conversations, but nope, not at all, not in, not in these rooms. So if, um, let me just look on here, so make sure I'm, yeah, a couple comments here. Great conversations, room four, thanks for the rich conversation. Um, and yeah, just kind of reiterating that. So I'm gonna ask you to share a couple of themes. Um, and it, we do have a shared Google Doc, is that right, Jody? Um, yeah, so if um, you can, if you haven't put it on the shared Google Doc, can you put those common themes there just so we can wrap it up in a nice little bundle? Well, not me, it'll be the, the planning committee can wrap it up in a nice little bundle and, and share with you, um, what you what you experienced and what you shared. So I'm gonna start uh, with group eight. Can you share a, a few common themes under each of the questions or whichever questions you choose? Um, sure, um, I can start and then other group eight members, please jump in if I miss something. So we had uh, Anne, Sue, Michelle, Amanda, Randy and me in our group. And some of, for the first question, some of the themes, I'm, I'm just gonna do really broad, um, but uh, were about geography and moving came up for our group and belonging and how belonging um, looked different in different geographies and different internal and external factors to belonging. Um, for the second question, uh, understanding of culture connected to race, that geographical and contextual part came up again for us. And there was some, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't, or it's complicated, or sometimes, or questions like, how does it fit when um, your culture um, you may be white, but your culture isn't, may not fit with like a dominant white culture. Um, and so how does that fit, whether it's a language difference, a religious difference um, from, uh, from kind of the dominant culture. And then we talked happily about food, one of our, my favorite topics, and um, how food builds community and also how food's connected to geography and connected to the land. Uh, for the last part, we, uh, Oh, we didn't get to the themes, but, um, but institutionally we discussed the themes of how cultures that students bring with them and cultures that they develop together within their um, programs of study or within their faculty. So um, like proudly wearing their, um, their different hoodies with their program areas or like really proud to be part of the um, medical faculty, however that looks at your institution and then kind of jiving all these multiple identities and figuring those out together in this new post-secondary environment. So those are some of the themes that came up for us. Nice. Uh, six. Group six. Oh, hello, yes, I was <laughs> adding the, <laughs> the comments to our document. 
uh, because I have it on in handwriting. Um, for the first question, um, pretty much what we uh, share was that um, for us, culture is a community of shared interests, a commonality. Um, what makes us who we are, language, food, music, customs, shared patterns of behavior of groups. And for question number two, um, we, well, we still have a very um, mixed or diverse background. And uh, for us, uh, culture uh, could be related to race, but it's not only that, and um, that currently, it's very much connected to race because superficially we tend to classify, make connections to race, but um, it has become a political and social construct and a culture has become politi politically connected with what somebody's skin tone is and previously was more related with family groups or community groups. And for question number three, um, basically what we, uh, Cut to discuss was that we have to be accepting of whatever people bring to the table, regardless of the background. Nobody should be outed because they have any different background or culture. And institutions should focus on the core on core values that are irrespective of of race or culture in terms of respect, stewardship, and community, and that people want to be part of that. Thanks. Group four. I'll speak on behalf of group four. I hope I ca capture everything correctly. Um, in my group, we had uh, myself, and I'm not gonna say everyone's name, just to cover it a little bit. Uh, we talked about some of the things that a lot of people have already discussed, which is uh, feeling part of the institution, the background uh, affiliation, feeling connected, as a, a, a running theme, I mentioned culture can range from religion affiliation to race. Um, also being represented, a lot of the uh, students sometimes don't feel like they have a true representation of when they're at their institution. And someone brought up the digital divide, which I thought was great. Uh, having, thing, having perspective that you automatically assume that everyone has access to the internet uh, or, or web-based information, and that may not always be true. Um, also, one thing that I thought was very interesting was the culture that is a more reactive versus a proactive approach um, and, and getting buy-in from leadership to faculty on, on the importance of, of meeting the needs of your student population. I hope I got all of that. Very good. I'm trying to keep notes, too, of everybody. Um, and group two. I think that's us. So um, I was the note keeper, so I'll do my best to summarize. Um, the first question, um, some, some commonalities that came out were, and what's been said, a sense of belonging. Uh, we talked about rituals, habits, and practices, and, and how humans come together. Um, and we, we did talk a bit, not necessarily about geography, but um, living together and how uh, living close to one another impacts culture. Uh, well, the second question, um, we said that race definitely impacts culture, but it was uh, different for different people in terms of the choice they had and how that impacted their culture, as well as um, feeling that they need to represent, you know, they have their own experience and that's not necessarily representative of everybody uh, from that race. But we talked about it being just a one aspect of, of a very complex um, and fluid notion of identity. We talked about how con context impacts, um, impacts culture and how we self-identify. Um, yeah, uh, people came up with the idea of a puzzle and that race is one part of the puzzle piece of identity. And then for the third um, question, we, we talked, it uh, seemed everybody sort of reflected on their personal experience, um, how their um, culture and their race impacts how they do their work. Um, 
um, and then talked about the diversity of our student body um, and how people bring, I think somebody else said this is already, but we, our students bring cultural identities with them, um, but then we're also a community or a culture within our classrooms and our institutions. Hopefully I captured that accurately. Great. Uh, group one. Okay, so uh, this is Ravinder. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, our group, we had Mary, Leah, Ron, uh, myself, and Jennifer. Um, we had a really great conversation about culture. So looking at understand of, understanding of culture, we talked about how culture has um, is very strong and it can really control all aspects of a system. Um, culture is about art art, um, beliefs, music, attitudes, achievements. Um, it can uh, unite us and separate us. Um, who and we talked about, about who and what um, do I identify with? Uh, is it a smaller group? Is it a larger group? Um, so this invisible thing with such great social control. We also talked about uh, for some of us culture was not connected to race and for others it was strongly connected to race. Um, so we also looked at strong connections between UDL, culture, culturally responsive teaching as well. Um, and then cultural considerations, are students seeing themselves reflect, reflected in course content, course material um, on campuses? Um, personally, culture, uh, looked at culture of disability, um, so looking at identity first. Um, and culturally responsive practices related to Black, Latino culture, LGBTQ. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything uh, the team wanted to add to that. That's great. Yeah. There's no ratings. So uh, <laughs> let's go to three. Group three. Maybe you're on mute. Maybe there was no group three. There was someone in the chat from group three who said they had to jump to another meeting because someone else talked. So, and that was Megan. So I don't know if anyone else from group three didn't see that. Or... Hey, Jamie, how about I volunteer you? <laughs> are, you are you volunteering me? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so we had, I'm just looking at our notes here. So we had, I, I think, to, to kind of summarize, um, for the first question, we talked about um, different aspects of our identity um, and kind of smaller subcultures and kind of the multifaceted nature of identity and like how culture um, can kind of change in some ways, depending on uh, it says here, yeah, cultural identity is mediated um, sometimes by a larger group. Um, and we talked about, in some cases, being able to hide certain aspects of our identity or cultures that we feel that are part of us or we feel connected to. Um, and uh, there was a larger concern about uh, fixed beliefs, yeah, and fitting ourselves into the dominant culture of wherever we happen to be, if that makes sense, um, and maybe losing parts of ourselves um, in that process. Um, for the second question, we, yeah, we talked about, uh, and that's kind of I'm going into the second question a little bit. We were talking about, um, yeah, code switching or culture switching, in a sense, um, based on the environment we're in. Um, and we did reflect on um, uh, COVID-19 and, and how certain inequalities and inequities have really been heightened or exacerbated in this, in, uh, during this pandemic. Um, and we were talking about understanding our own privilege um, and that connection to culture. 
Um, and we were talking about, yeah, race and culture. There was a lot of self-reflection, I feel, and a lot of sharing of, of personal experience um, as well. Um, and for the final question, um, identity and culture, we talked about identity and culture overlapping, um, but when the individual does not have agency, um, a culture which does not match one's identities may be oppressive um, or erasing. Um, and we talked about the educational system. Um, and we talked about the idea of colorblindness, for example. Um, and, and, and that was the, that was the indoctrination. <laughs> um, uh, for for quite a while, at least here in Toronto, for a long time in our system, and uh, and just how that would have made people uh, feel. Um, so that's kind of where we left off, and people of color, um, racialized minorities, how they would have felt. Um, yeah, I don't know. That could have been a terrible job summarizing, but if anyone wants to add in, please do. Oh, that was great. Um, group five. I can um, go over that if you like. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, first question was about understanding of culture. The themes of discussion were that it can be about race, but uh, also uh, tradition within a community or institution, and that you can feel disconnected from your own culture and tradition, and that that feels very unmooring no matter what perspective you're coming from. Uh, the second one is it strongly connected to race. The sort of discussion we had was not necessarily. However, if one feels like they're marginalized, they're part of a community which is marginalized by a dominant culture, they can feel a stronger connection to their own community in self-defense, essentially. Or they can feel as if they dissolve their identity to assimilate, such as when someone says, for instance, don't speak your mother tongue within that particular context because it will identify you. It's not part of the successful culture in some way, shape, or form. And we also discussed um, systems, how they in general can demean um, unintentionally or intentionally uh, cultures by prioritizing certain outcomes or content or forms of assessment and how challenging that can be. Because if you choose a form of assessment, like a rubric or anonymous grading, uh, can you then empathize with the student in such a way as to understand how their culture connects to what they're doing? On the other hand, though, if you don't use those tools, are you then vulnerable to unintentional bias by virtue of um, unintentionally saying that this person, they're not capable of that kind of a work, and I'm going to give you a worse grade, not because you earned it, but because unintentionally I'm biased against someone from your culture. So those are the um, pieces that came out for myself. Um, if anybody else in the group wants to point out things, it was myself, uh, Anne, Marie Risto, Laura Wigner, and Jennifer Christ. Thank you. And finally, saving the best for last, group seven. Anybody from group seven? Well, we are group nine. I don't think uh, we have presented. Mm. Okay, group nine, go ahead, group nine. Okay, I'm the note taker, so I will go. Um, we have Sahela, Lillian, Ruta, Katie and I. Um, we have mom was toddler, mom was teenagers, and um, we have Iranian, Chinese, English, Canadian, and like, all over the world. Uh, well, we discussed uh, culture is a set of beliefs, customs, etc., but it is definitely different from race. Uh, and uh, um, um, Sahila so um, shared that tolerance and understanding is super important when interacting with people from different cultural backgrounds. Uh, 
So we all appreciate her sharing on that. And we each shared some strategies in teaching applications. Uh, someone shared that using online repository for staff to share their hobbies uh, or for students, we could do similar activity for them to share. Um, and uh, I think it was Lillian uh, tell, have an activity for her class to tell their name story. And this activity unpack many cultural factors in every student's lives. So, um, just uh, have students introduce their name and the story bef behind how they get their name. So that's quite interesting. And uh, um, I had an experience attending a Zoom meeting, which the um, facilitator asked us to change our virtual backgrounds to our uh, favorite food, to our favorite music, to our travel destination, idea, ideal you know, dream vacation spot, something like that. And to help us get to know each other. Um, so there's many ways we can introduce culture with our students uh, as an activity. And also uh, we talked a little bit about institutional level. Every institution has its own culture. That's a brief one. Thanks. And was there anybody, was there a group seven? We, we were group seven. I think we just uh, um, gave ourselves um, our own row in the Google Doc because that's, that's how we roll. Okay. <laughs> so was that group nine that was group seven? Group? Yes, yes. Okay. Perfect, thank you so much um, for all of that rich conversation. Um, I'm gonna pull us right back and share my screen um, again. Let me, apologies. So. I had a bunch of little little windows there so it took me a bit to navigate back so we we've shared um, our our different groups and what we've come about uh, as far as our understanding of culture some of those commonalities were what is culture we we or how do we identify our, our understandings of culture um, it, we had beliefs we had customs commonalities and, and wrapping all of that up was a sense of belonging and sense of being a part of something. Um, it could be rituals, habits, and, and really that uh, a note that was taken off there is, or that I took from that was, um, it's how we live in our approach to doing things. It was also something very, very important and kind of um, tied things together as well. When we're talking about uh, our understanding and experience with culture and is it strongly connected to race, there was one group, um, I believe it was group one that I popped into. And, um, and I explained why I do that because some people think that, um, well, I, it's a baiting question. A am I baiting people to talk about race possibly? Um, but it's not really. I, I think that uh, it would we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge um, race and how that immediately comes to the forefront when we're talking about culture. And when I introduced the the idea of us going into small groups, um, I identified immediately about how how my um, culture, whether I mean it to or not, whether it's intentional or not, plays a part in, in teaching and learning for me. Um, and, and it can be intentional, uh, the fact of using my language or introducing myself in a specific way or conducting or facilitating or teaching or learning in, in individual ways. Um, so having that question about uh, how strongly are we connected, it's also about identifying um, what happens um, maybe unintentionally, how we just immediately start having those conversations. So I think it, maybe it was the third room that I jumped into. Um, and 
every room that I was jumping into, uh, it was part of the conversation, whether it was somebody saying, well, I identify as, as Caucasian or I identify as a new Canadian or new um, American. Um, I have two, two identities. Um, I believe somebody shared, um, and I hopefully that's okay, um, shared, well, I'm, I'm an immigrant from this country and I live in this country, but the United States where I am now is, is how I identify and I happen to have this other culture that comes with me based on race and where I was born. So nationality also plays a role. Some of the th common threads that you guys shared was um, that um, we in experiencing culture and race and things like that uh, can have our, our own culture changed. It can be enhanced, it can grow, it can pull back, we can get tighter with those things. Um, it is political, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, it is what it is, right? It's, it's how our, our, um, our continent operates. It, and that's something that the culture, um, systemic culture, and how that's kind of infused into our own understanding and how we operate. For some people, um, the fact that race is included into our, our understanding or, or connected to our understanding of culture. So for some people, it can be superficial. For some people, I heard it can be um, a bit oppressive and, and some people choose to assimilate into dominant culture. And you often see people in, in, um, with physical exceptionalities as well kind of assimilate. And, and that's a, a really big piece of that wanting to belong, our initial and foundational understanding of culture. Um, and finally, the what are cultural considerations for you personally, your institution and greater community? Lots of great stuff in there. Um, so understanding and recognizing that our individual understanding of culture overlaps and we contribute to that institution, to that community, and to each other personally. Um, again, it can be um, influenced by dominant culture and possibly uh, losing ourselves is something that somebody said. Um, and identifying is our institutional culture and greater community culture visible? Um, can students see themselves? Can they see their own culture within that community? And I would add to that and say, can we see ourselves as educators in those places, in the institution, and in the greater community? Um, I really appreciated um, people adding in there about assessments, um, about the systems and how they, they could be a bit oppress um, oppressive. And really the big theme there was that um, any kind of culture, any kind of whether it's personal institution or greater community shouldn't be painted with broad brushstrokes, that none of us are, are the same. Um, so that's a really, again, they were really hugely um, rich conversations and we are a little behind, but that tends to happen and, and absolutely just adds to our conversation. Um, so I wanna move down to the, um, the next slide here and talk about um, culture. Actually, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna talk to you guys about my understanding on the agenda and then we'll go to um, more about culture, more about our under, uh, more about our in-depth. So for me, talking about Indigenous pedagogy, epistemology, and uh, UDL, um, what that has been for me is, is if I was uh, that painter, uh, Ross, what's his last name, um, with happy little accidents, I think that's what uh, he, he used to say. Um, that's kind of, Bob Ross, that's it. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so to me, when I think about how I came into um, the world, and I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, I don't want to, uh, how I came into the academic world and how I got to where I am, and I kind of um, um, alluded to it a little bit in my introduction and said I've been involved at the post-secondary 
a level for about 12, 13 years, but they only put me on the payroll four years ago. Yes, the painter of like happy little trees, happy little accidents. Um, so for me, I was raised traditionally, traditionally Anishinaabe, um, which meant um, every, a lot of teaching opportunities um, because I was raised traditionally and how I understand that um, is that I was raised with all of our creation stories, with our ceremonies, with um, having mentors and sponsors and mentees and teachers. Um, I was raised in a traditional family, which meant that I had uh, my family wasn't just blood family and birth family, it was clan family, it was traditional family. Um, anybody that was a, a certain amount of years older than me and lived within our, our kind of community was known as uncle or auntie. Um, anybody that was younger than me was known as my niece or my nephew. And in those relationships, uh, what there always was, was there always was the opportunity to learn and to teach. And so uh, in that traditional way of being and, and um, what I would later learn would be uh, pedagogy and epistemology was um, how we are fluid and very open and organic as, as to the individuals that come and go into our circles, um, come and go into our, our daily life. And for me, um, Academics was something that uh, I actually uh, shied away from because I seen that from my historical background and from my historical experience and shared history with, with everyone in North America and in other continents, um, the, the colonization and the trauma associated with that was something that um, made me shy away and to actively say no, I'm not an academic. No, I, I'm not uh, this and oh, that universal design for learning. No, I'm, I'm indigenous pedagogy and epistemology and culture responsive pedagogy. Mm, yeah, I guess it touches someplace. And it took a while for, for me to be um, acknowledge these things. And so when, when I was working and volunteering and spending the majority of my time and in the institution, that was me kind of dipping my foot into it uh, and finding those intersectional intersections of, um, of um, culture, of race, of um, pedagogy, um, all of those ways in which we are. And one of the, the areas that I found most welcoming and, uh, and most I guess safe. Uh, if I were to look at my 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 understanding and my personal understanding of teaching and learning, was the learning design and support team at the institution uh, where I was at. And one of the the shared tools that I would say was was very welcome and very familiar before I even knew what was what it was called was universal design for learning. Um, I didn't come into uh, understanding and even identifying uh, how I learned and how I taught as even Indigenous pedagogy um, because that was academic, right? And that was something that I tried to shy away from. Um, but I didn't even come to those understandings until I found different safe places. And so one of the ways in which I, I teach and learn as well is identify those, those places of intersection identify those places of commonalities and identify those places that support each other. And so universal design for learning just in its name and just in its conception and how things happen, it's universal. There's automatically that room for those places of intersectionality, um, automatically welcoming to tons of people. Um, and it was not that I had to change how I learned or how I taught or how um, I just existed in, in everyday life or institution. It was just, I had to be um, identified and acknowledge it, which I thought was um, pretty, pretty cool because I didn't have to change. And, and my own experience as a, um, a marginalized a person, um, a visible minority, um, and all the experiences that I've had um, as a teacher, 
all the time I always found myself fighting for a space, fighting for a space to practice uh, oral um, history, oral teaching without a PowerPoint and without um, a handout. Um, and, and also as a learner, how that was difficult for me when there was nothing but narratives handed to me, nothing but steps that I had to learn by rote um, and be able to regurgitate so that I could get a passing mark so that my assessments were, were on par. So um, all, of those, all of those things were, were uh, welcoming. Um, a lot of places where um, I had difficulty as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, um, learning, I found those places um, and found those, those places to share and to utilize in my own teaching for students that struggled in the same way that I did, as well as for my colleagues. Um, so where we would have guidelines when we're looking at the universal design for learning, uh, what are the what are the components of it? How do I go through these? How do I identify what I need to do? How I need to do it? When I need to do it? Um, for indigenous pedagogy, indigenous way of being in life, those are our protocols. Those are ways of doing. Those are our cyclical uh, ways of being. Whether it's um, in something very simple like a, a medicine wheel. Um, it's it's kind of how things happen. It's non-linear, and for universal design for learning, to me, is non-linear as well. It means we might have a plan, um, but it has to be organic and it has to be fluid. That uh, we we're taking in and considering all of those different places and all of those different areas um, that our learners take us, and that we as as learners ourselves need to take it. Um, it's acknowledging, um, just like you guys were sharing, um, about our institutions and sometimes they're oppressive and sometimes they're, um, uh, there's the, uh, uh, I would, I wouldn't call it an opportunity. There's the, the possibility that we might sometimes lose ourselves. Um, and for some people we assimilate and moving from, um, a professor role into an uh, administrative role, I can tell you for sure, <laughs> there's lots of times that I lose myself in that institutional or colonial um, place and system. I think it's super, super important and, and has been really um, important for me to identify that it is the system that is oppressive or is the system that is colonial. And it's a system that um, has been in place for uh, centuries. It doesn't mean that we in that system or we in that way of teaching and learning and doing things, whether we're students or faculty or uh, learning design and support specialists or administrators, it doesn't mean that we uh, have to take it to that point where we're oppressive um, or uh, have those systemic issues the same way that the, the systems are, the, the institutions are built. And even having this conversation is, is also such a huge um, place of intersection for me. Uh, such a place of meeting where it's like, well, I know that things aren't going to change. There's always going to be a president or a provost. There's always going to be senior management teams and learning design and support teams. But how we operate within those systems um, and how we take universal design for learning or uh, our own culture and combine and support, use those things to support them. Um, again, the thing that really spoke out it, to me was how strong those things are together, how strong culture and universal design for learning, supporting each other, um, how they can unite and separate the words here, separate social, uh, separate the, um, and support social control. They can create social control. I'm sorry if I'm misquoting the group that shared that, um, but understanding that universal design for learning 
in, in all honesty by itself without the support and the reciprocal relationships with other tools. And it doesn't have to be indigenous pedagogy, but other ways of doing things. Um, it could also have that effect, those negative effects of culture with it, within an oppressive area. If we were to look at universal design for learning and say by itself, how many of us struggle in our institutions to get other teams on board? to look at curriculum mapping the same way that we do, to say that, um, to say that, uh, that one teacher that insists on being the sage on the stage year after year after year after year without saying, hey, how do I get my students to stand up and participate? How do I get them to relate? Um, we just need to uh, utilize these things and support each other and celebrate those areas of intersectionality without taking away from each other. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be indigenous pedagogy or, or nothing. It doesn't have to be universal design for learning or nothing. But what is unique and, and strong and supportive about universal design for learning in my experience is that the foundation, the guidelines, and the pillars are, are there and they support and can be that glue or those um, strings or um, in Anishinaabe Moan, we call it uh, Nui Kanigana. And it means that we're, and I mentioned this, I think in our planning, I think Eric, when we were talking, it means how are we all connected? And I use the example of, um, you know, those kinetic balls. I love those. I can relate that to any conversation. But for me, the way I see um, all of these ways or, or ways of learning, catalysts to learning that connect things and help the expansion and growth as well as maintaining that original structure is something uh, like universal design for learning. I think that indigenous pedagogy, I think that cultural responsive pedagogy, all of those individual tools that are there, um, are great and are not less than. But just the state of being universal um, are, is going to be the glue that is the catalyst for change um, for all of the work that we do in the institutions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of went off there, which I tend to do. Um, but I just wanted to share that. So that was my little um, blurb on or talk or about indigenous um, pedagogy and epistemology and UDL and that happy little mistake in my life um, of their, them colliding kind of together. I'm gonna share my screen again here and have a broader um, conversation about that. Questions, comments, um, take a break, although I mentioned that sage on the stage, I, I sometimes feel that way when I do a lot of um, talking. No? I have to get that silence. Yeah, Go ahead. Liz, it's uh, Jody. Um, also, just to remind folks, you can put questions in the chat. And as Jen said, there's a spot in the Google Doc, too, if there's questions that you'd like to add there. So just a couple options to point out. Back to you, Liz. Okay, and you guys will have to remind me or let me know if there's questions because I'm, I'm yeah. a bit multitasking, but not multitasking <laughs> screens. That's right, well, we'll keep an eye on the chat and yeah. poke you if. Uh... So if, uh, uh, to pull it all again together when we're talking about culture, uh, we're all in different places in our institutions. Institutions are all in different places in our communities, our families, our departments are all in different places. So we can look at what's appropriate to pull in and to, and to support uh, using UDL by looking at, and there's tons of these, these um, diagrams. I tried to pick one with large font and that was very general in its description of that cultural iceberg. So thinking about where are we at collectively, if you're from an institution that doesn't rely heavily on international students, although I don't know where there is one of those, those institutions, then that could be part of the visioning um, or, or different part of your visioning from an institution that does rely heavily on something like international students. If you have a community, um, so the community here at Peterborough, 
we have four First Nations surrounding and in our territory. So that's part of our visioning when we're looking at um, not just our teaching and learning in individual classrooms, but throughout the whole institution. So it may not be a part of somebody's visioning uh, for their department, for their classroom, for their institution. If you're, um, um, let's say, uh, if I was in Detroit, uh, I grew up in Detroit for a number of years and um, it wasn't anything that if I was working professionally in Detroit, it probably wouldn't be the first thing that I thought about as far as visioning. visioning. If I looked personally, of course, that was part of my life. If, if I looked um, within my team, it was something that I brought to the team. Um, but as far as it wouldn't necessarily be something that I would propose as one of those guiding strategies uh, if I'm visioning for the institution. And then we can go farther and farther down and acknowledge the, the things of the iceberg on the very top or what we see. The middle part is what we might share when we engage more with a specific culture. And then at the very bottom, those are the things we don't see. Those are things we don't understand um, unless we are living. And even sometimes when we're living, there, there are things that we do that we're not totally aware of. Um, I had students, uh, one of the, I'll use this example, those things that we're not necessarily aware of. Um, I was speaking to a group of students and I wasn't, um, and I was giving teachings and uh, <clears throat> I never really realized that maybe it's not apparent to, to people here, um, but one of the indigenous students actually that happened to be in the room um, said, I like how you say certain words and you have, a, you don't have a total indigenous accent, but you have some words that you still say with an indigenous accent. And so for me, I was like, oh, I never considered myself having an indigenous accent. And, and but um, first I took it ego, like, oh, do I have that? And how do I get rid of it? Or how do I make it stronger? Or how do I do this? Um, and then afterwards I thought about it and it was like, that was that unconscious part there where that student in that moment felt like they belonged, right? And if I would have got out of my head an ego, then I would have said, hey, we're in the same place, we belong. You know, and would have felt that fellowship as opposed to that ego response, which is human, which is again, um, part of the way I live is, is acknowledging my humanness. Um, so I'm going to skip down here a little bit. When we're talking about those frameworks and looking at how they um, intersect, looking at the time, how they intersect, um, I, I found this from the University of Saskatchewan and their research. It's not 100%, but I know there's, uh, I do really well with visuals, um, understanding if I can get an idea of something that is cultural um, and for me again going back to that place of indigenous pedagogy and epistemology um, and how we can compare it and find those intersection those places that intersect um, i would kind of put it into something like this <laughs> and it would be how would this cultural um, view and how would this universal design for learning, maybe this one, um, a little bit more um, in depth of recognizing uh, the multiple ways that we recognize um, in the classroom what's happening. How do we, multiple ways and means in which we engage, in which we represent, um, in which we have action and expression um, into the classroom. Why are we learning? How are we learning? What are we learning? Um, so if we were to look at these couple places, and we don't have to, you can look at the discussions that you've had in the classroom, in, or in the classroom, in the small groups, and you started to do that already. So we had the examples of, um, of the story of our names. Great example. So using that, and for me, what it triggered is, is uh, I, have a, I have a traditional name, which I shared with you guys at the beginning in the language. And I shared with you, I said, Neiman Majik Kang Play Dishnikas. So I basically said my name. Uh, I don't often translate it because my name traditionally isn't uh, 
literally translated into English. Uh, the ceremony in which I got my name was about four hours long and about two hours of that was just the story of my name. And so for me, translating it uh, is a long time for, for the classroom. I have talked about it a, a little bit, um, but sharing that story of our names really triggered things. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's awesome. I'm gonna talk to the faculty that I work with and say, how can we bring that into the classroom? Virtual backgrounds, that's bringing that uh, different cultures into the classroom um, and making sure that puzzle that somebody acknowledged, it's a puzzle. So how do we, how do we separate that? How do we dump that puzzle? Um, I did lots of puzzles in the time of COVID here, but how do we dump those pieces out and fit them together and acknowledge each one of those pieces? So I don't think we're going to go into small groups because we're we're pretty tight on time and I want to give you guys opportunity. But what I would like to do is if you're you're familiar, I'm assuming you're familiar with the UDL. If you need something to look at visibly, I'm going to share uh, this page and just ask you for some more of those places that those intersections are for you whether they're tools that you use already. I think that it's very important that we acknowledge missteps, maybe where we took a wrong turn and had some uh, meeting there and, and where maybe you don't want to go um, anymore as or to go back to or what have you learned from that place. Um, what intersections haven't you tried yet can you embrace? Um, so looking back, it's what intersections am I already experiencing and using, utilizing? Uh, how are they supported by UDL or by cultural, uh, by culture? Uh, what intersections can I embrace that I've heard or that I've thought or what has been um, kind of aha moments or anything like that? And what intersections do I want to avoid? So I am just going to open my screens up a little bit more here and try to find my chat. I think participants. I think I have to stop sharing. Do I, Jody? Oh no, there it is. Got it. You good? Yeah, I got it. So I have um, from Jessica. I find UDL is often presented as apolitical, scientific, which is not um, wait, which is not apolitical. Do you think this was strategic? Is it reference is refreshing to hear you talk about intersecting with culture? So comments? Just a sh short comment. Just to meet yourself. I find it. I find it refreshing. Um, and when I'm talking and when I'm sharing when I was sharing about my personal experiences, those happy intersections, um, I just keep picturing his his little fro going on there. Um, and I seen you nodding. I seen a lot of you nodding. Uh, to me, that's what's refreshing, right? And that's those those places where we meet. Um, so I would hazard, even though it doesn't seem like anybody necessarily wants to share, I, I would say that from my view, it, it did look refreshing for a lot of people. Um, it did oftentimes we're taught to be professional and how we define professional is arm's length so we don't share these things uh culture is personal and to be professional then it's it's not um, necessarily appropriate to share these things um i told the line i push the line all the time um appropriate self-disclosure that I practiced and made mistakes uh, is, is always important and really making sure you're in safe places all the time to, to share. So I, I strongly encourage sticking your toes in the water as opposed to swan diving, diving off of a cliff. Um, yeah, so it's not my experience that others find the UDL culture threatening. 
Sometimes I find uh, are resistant to change or to use UDL in their practice, but I find the cultures quite welcoming to all levels of readiness experience. Uh, that's been my experience. <laughs> Thanks for the Bob Ross reference. I do that. I do that in the classroom too when I talk about uh, there's a lot of resistance to Indigenous uh, studies. Um, when I was in the classroom, I had a number of students resistant to it. And I'd use the reference about drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm like, I'm not trying to get you to drink the Kool-Aid. And not too many people knew what I was talking about. So Bob Ross, Kool-Aid, yeah. Um, as far as UDL uh, and my first experiences with it, I must say um, that people uh, that utilize UDL and that um, really embrace it um, are pretty passionate about it and it can be a little intimidating it absolutely can be a little intimidating um, myself uh, i don't believe that it's um, it caused any resistance in me it intrigued me so i think it all depends on the person but i do think that it, it could be a little bit intimidating for people um, puzzle visual Ron spoke to the idea of culture in our room. Um, why do people like us find it welcoming and exciting and others find it threatening and oppressive? Because they're not cool. <laughs> because because we're, we're open to those things. It takes, a, it takes a really, truly um, passion for teaching and learning, honestly. And if we're open to the idea of learning, then we're open to the idea of there's other ways of doing things. Um, I don't find that, uh, I, I find UDL welcoming. I find cultural responsive pedagogy exciting. I find indigenous pedagogy, uh, all kinds of ways of doing things. I, um, and I think that we have those that us, those of us that are passionate about teaching and learning are open to different ways of doing things. Um, those that are stuck in ways of doing things, I'll often see, or in my experience, I, I don't see too much passion. Those are the people that come in almost to punch their proverbial um, time clock, do their classes and go uh, sort of thing. Um, trying to scroll down a bit here. Yeah, um, Liz, we have a question in the Google Doc too, um, and I can throw it in the chat if that's helpful. Um, so it says, how do we hold conversations about culture without putting our uh, BIO BIPOC students on the spot? I have heard several students sharing that they are frustrated that they are called upon to represent their race. So I just threw that in the chat too for the okay. text base. I want to say that is an amazing question. So let's critically examine this question and I'll tell you exactly um, what happened for me. So how do we hold conversations about culture without putting our um, BIPOC students on the spot? So you're assuming that they want or need or express or automatically should be a part of the conversation. It's only up to them to decide whether they're going to be a part of the conversation. We should never be afraid to have or to start or to talk about these things. As long as you identify, self-identify yourself and where you are in the conversation. So um, as educators, we automatically want to be inclusive and to pull people in and to engage people and to have those. We, I love to see when people are nodding on the screen. It's like, oh yeah, they're, they're, we're finding that common place. Um, I think that we need to um, still have those conversations. I still have gone to classrooms where um, I'm so excited. I think the students are gonna be excited about the topic for that day and they're all sitting there and I don't know if there's anything, if they've heard anything that I've said. And, and we can throw them little lines and invite them into the conversation, um, but if they don't take it, uh, we don't have or talk about their viewpoint for them. And we acknowledge that that's maybe not the right time. 
um, or that's not the right space. And it's also an indication that it might not be a safe place. So it makes us turn and look back and say, what about this space? What about this style? Um, am I doing in, in a time for self-reflection and awareness of creating that community within the classroom? And this triggers a whole other conversation about um, uh, cohorts and institutions and, and creating community again in the classroom in that one small space of time in, in, in some um, semesters. Can we create that community? So like I don't I don't think you have to have it. I don't think it's a um I don't think it's a requirement to have this conversation. I, I do think that you need to be open to have it and you need to be okay having it and position and positioning yourself and identifying your positionality in the conversation. So this comes up a lot when we're talking about um or when I'm talking about reconciliation in Canada, reconciliation in North America, uh, cultural um, safety. Um, because again, as educators, we wanna pull people and be inclusive and, and make space for other ways of being. Um, but when we um, invite people, even just invite people with a glance, invite people directly, then that's, uh, that's, I think, what you're talking about, putting them on the spot, which isn't necessarily um, the best kind of place to be. Um, yes, I was frustrated when I was a student and in classrooms. Um, I sit at a board table, and when we talk about diversity, most of the table looks, at, looks down, at, down the table at me and say, I get invited to all kinds of tables because I'm the visible minority and I need to be um, the indigenous voice on everything. Um, and what I do is I call it out, but I do it in a gentle way because I still wanna be invited to the table. I still have a responsibility to make sure that voice is heard and present, um, but I, I do call them out. I, I absolutely do. I'll say, okay, I'm indigenous, but I'm not indigenous to this territory. So you're asking me to speak on behalf of the Michisigig people here in Peterborough, and I'm not, I'm not from here. I'm a settler here. And they get really confused about that. But you're indigenous. I said, yeah, but I'm not anywhere near here. They speak funny. It may be Ojibwe, but they drop vowels. <laughs> so anyway, um, so it's, it's really important to um, call that out and talk about it and position yourself. So... Um, I guess that's what the answer to that would I would be is still start the conversation, but start it from your own positionality. That way you're calling yourself out or putting yourself on the spot, which creates a safe place. I'm sorry, I'm going off again. We've, we've got this. another uh, question in the Google Doc. Okay. If that's, uh, cool, it's a little bit longer, so I'm just gonna post it in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and read it. So even though we operate as people with intersect, intersecting cultural identities, it is often difficult to present research-based material and how those intersecting identities play out in individuals, two people interacting, social groups, and media. Instead, we often find ourselves focusing on a single cultural group. How do we present meaningful experiences and recognize that those experience, experiences are not going to exist for everyone who is part of those cultural groups. For example, there was an article in the newspaper today by a man who said his black children were reared in an environment that was more similar than a white privileged environment than many white, white children are. Okay, that was a lot, but I'm gonna ask you to read it again. Okay, Just it's sorry. there in the chat. Where's it at? Go ahead, can you read it again? I'm sorry, Jody. Um, I'll maybe I'll just read the question. Is that yeah. okay, Liz? As opposed to the context part. So, how do we present meaningful experiences and recognize that those experiences are not going to exist for everyone who is part of those cultural groups? That's a big question too. Um. So, for example. 
There was an article in the newspaper today by a man who said his black children were reared in an environment that was more similar to a white privileged environment than many white children are. So the research part is, is really important. And, and some of the things that I have done, um, so actually Jody, myself and another colleague did a, um, research for uh, the East Coast in, here in Canada. And one of the things that we had to identify that we may not have identified in the early planning stages was um, really be conscious, conscious and thoughtful and name the, the history of a, an area or territory uh, or group that we were cr doing the research on. Um, coincidentally, this, um, that thing there, that uh, diagram there is from research. Um, so what we, we had to do, um, and specifically that example um, included uh, Black Nova Scotians. And I wasn't uh, totally familiar. I had some familiarity with the, the East Coast culture and the East Coast um, um, institutional culture and geographical history and, and cultural history and all of those things, racial history um, of Nova Scotia. So for me, um, what it meant was we thoughtfully and intentionally added that history to our research. So right at the very beginning when we did our, our um, um, laid out the framework and our introduction for the research is we identified the history. So you don't necessarily have to um, identify those individual people because that also can be oppressive as saying, well, this person said this. So they don't represent all of this specific group or this cultural group or this cultural identity. Um, and I said that a bit harshly, but sometimes that's how it feels. Um, so it can be a form of um, lateral violence, I guess, to call people out um, in a way that isn't um, what we consider. So I would say in the news story uh, where this person said, well, my children were reared more uh, in an environment that was more similar to a white privileged environment than, any, uh, than many white children were. Um, so it's funny because my son identifies as, as privileged and he's visibly indigenous as well. And I have identified to him and called him out at, at, on it and said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about um, not, uh, not just privilege, but the context in which you are using is oppressive, not only to indigenous people, uh, but also to non-indigenous people because that privilege and the use of those terminologies can be oppressive and, and people sometimes feel bad about those things. So my example, and again, I'm going off on my apologies, would be really to identify all of those contributing factors. So if there's a history there, if there's a history that's different than that, that broad history of um, people in a broader geographical area, if there's a history, if there's a context that is specific to that one group that you're talking about, that one group that you're working with, then be conscious and purposeful about acknowledging that difference. So it's taking those broad brushstrokes away, even if somebody else is identifying them for you. Did that answer that? Maybe. Oh my goodness, there's so many messages. Yes, the chats, the chats are hopping, um, which is great. Yeah. And um, I just want to check in um, about the time. It says 2.52 here, so we've got about five to eight minutes left. So not to rush, but just want yeah. to acknowledge that we can't spend all day together. <laughs> so Liz, there's there someone oh, go ahead. There's yeah. something that's been buzzing my head for a while here that I'm, I'm trying to trying to get a handle on. So, you know, we were talking in, in my small group, whatever we were, three or four, um, about how, how culture, a lot of the time we identify with culture, but sometimes we're in a culture where that it doesn't match your identity. You know, like yeah. when, we're, when we're visiting a, a foreign country, you know, or we don't speak the language or whatever, um, you know, and that can be exciting and, and new, but when you're visiting and when you're living there, it's a little bit different, you know, it's, it's harder. And so that there's that agency aspect here of when my, when I choose my culture 
or when I choose to have the culture affect my identity, that's one thing. And when I'm in a situation in which I don't have agency in the culture that I'm forced to be in, that's a very different sort of situation. And so I think what we were, we were talking about is that schools oftentimes have a culture that has been driven by the dominant powers that be, racially, economically, socially, um, that, that in that way may disenfranchise a lot of students, especially people like ESL, uh, English language learners, you know, and, and so on and so forth, where you're just expected to conform rather than we're going to, you know, adapt to the fact that you're different, you know, and, and that let that be okay. It's expected that you'll get on board as quickly as possible. And that's, that's what our energies are given for. Um, but I'm also thinking about this in terms of some of the conversation that's been floating on the chat and so forth, the institutes of higher education, especially research one institutions and so on and so forth, they have a culture too. Yeah. And a lot of the faculty who are, who are in that culture identify with that culture. And, and UDL, I think, can be threatening because we're saying that culture has to change. And if you identify with that culture, then you have to change. <laughs> like that, so are we, are we doing the same thing that we're saying we should not be doing? So just like I said about that instance in the classroom where you have to position yourself, where you have to stand up and you have to push, push the line uh, or to, um, rather than toe the line, um, I think that that's the case everywhere. So I would argue that even in the extreme circumstance where you're in a, a absolute foreign place, not necessarily foreign country, but an absolute foreign place. Um, and again, I, I traveled and and I'm from the South. I, I grew up in Southwestern um, United or Michigan and Canada. Um, although my community is far, I consider far, far north, I, I'm not, um, I don't like tromping through the bush. I don't like camping. I would rather stay in a hotel and have jets in my tub. Um, and, and that's just kind of me. Um, so when I worked in remote fly-in communities um, in Canada, that was culture shock. Uh, it was culture shock on all levels um, for me. And so my first instinct, and I think everybody's shirt first instinct should be, you stop and you take stock. That's our research. That's our assessment of the situation. And we decide and, and identify um, which pieces of that culture we can live with and, and, um, and which we can, we can embrace. Um, but we also need to consciously identify which pieces of our own culture are appropriate and non-offensive and non-oppressive to bring to that space too. Um, so it's not about um, not having a choice. It's not about um, not having a voice because it's almost, uh, when you state it that way, it doesn't, uh, it's almost like you're holding yourself back. And, and this comes from my indigenous, indigeneity, is there comes, I always felt strongly about my culture, but I didn't talk about it all the time. Absolutely didn't talk about it. Didn't talk about it in most of the workplaces that I worked in. Um, I tried to conform. I tried to assimilate um, when I work with government, federal and provincial um, institution. When I first came to the institution, uh, I, I tried to be something that I thought fit there. It, um, and so I just floated along in those areas. And it wasn't until I embraced it and pushed the limit as far as my understanding um, of my culture and how it fit in those places where at first it didn't, I couldn't see any place where it would fit. Um, that, and, and Jody, because we're colleagues, I think can attest to this, that's when the, the, it almost seemed like so many doors opened within the institution, thousands and thousands of, thousands of employees. When I started sharing a little bit of my culture, they're like, hey, now I'll be honest, some of it was, it is and continues to be inappropriate. Like, hey, did you go to the powwow this weekend? I'm like, no, why would you assume that every powwow is the one I, I'm going to be at? Or, or no, I don't eat bannock all the time. Like there is that inappropriateness and I've been inappropriate. Um, so acknowledging that um, 
by recognizing myself, what pieces of my culture um, could be non-threatening and fit in a, in a healthy way, in a respectful way, that's when so much more opened up for me. So I think that um, even our decisions to go into those spaces um, are, are pushed and driven by finding those commonalities and, and, and wanting to share something about ourselves. And, and that's culture, right? So does that make sense, Eric? Yes, thank you so much. And for me, um, what is one pitch that we can use um, um, making space? So don't try to um, force feed somebody something or an idea. Ask them to make space for the possibility of another idea. So make space. That would be my bite-sized bit. Oh, and Liz, that's such an awesome bite-sized bit to wrap up our time together today with um, and just making space for those possibilities. And um, we, on behalf of the whole group here, we just all want to say thank you. The thank yous and the recognition in the chat is just overwhelming. And, um, and thanks just for bringing just who you are. You're my friend and colleague, and I'm just so glad that um, more people, um, we've all gotten to connect with more people today. A um, piece of advice from my teacher. Um, she told me to always tell people that um, what you're saying is just your story, your understanding, your experience. Um, it, it's not meant to be uh, t uh, directions or the only way of doing things. So if you've heard something here that's been useful, by all means, pick it up and utilize it. If you've heard, if heard things here that you think are, are, are uh, not relevant, just leave them here and, and you don't have to take them with you. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. And, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today and making space within your day for this important conversation. It feels like the time flew by for me and uh, it, I bet it did for others as well. So um, as you know, the conversation doesn't have to end here. We don't all disappear at three o'clock, even though the Zoom meeting ends. So if you'd like to continue this, you can reach out to people individually or you can consider hosting a follow-up pop-up. Um, that's something that Jen and Eric and I can certainly help you with. And, um, and just some, that's something to consider too about an extension of this topic or mm -hmm. something else. Um, we'll stay on the, Eric and Jen and I can probably stay on the call for another few minutes if people just have follow-up questions. But just wanna recognize that it is three o'clock and we might have another Zoom meeting to attend. <laughs> but many thanks, Liz and Eric and Jen, any closing comments before? It was amazing, Liz. Thank you so much for, for doing this and for, for starting out the whole pop-up idea. You know, I think this, this is a wonderful way to begin this. I just want to reiterate that we would love to have more of these and they don't have to be formal. You know, it, it can just be, hey, I've got an idea for next week, whoever can show. And that's, that's what this is supposed to be. Um, so these are informal times to have conversations. Okay, I think Jen is typing away there, but uh, um, but if you need to sign off now, uh, please do. And just again, thank you for being here and we'll see everybody again soon. Take care. Came out.